Welcome, everybody. I'm Joe Lombardo. I'm the coordinator of United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, which is co-sponsoring, um, which is sponsoring the webinar today, which will be a conversation with uh, Scott Ritter. And my co-host is Margaret Flowers, um, who I will introduce in a minute. So tonight we're going to talk about Ukraine, as if anybody in this country or anywhere else has been talking about anything else uh, recently. Uh, but we've been hearing a very one-sided uh, narrative of what is going on in Ukraine. Um, and so we want to have a discussion that hopefully can um, fill out that picture, bring a full, fuller picture of the situation um, uh, in Ukraine. And um, my uh, co-host is Margaret Flowers. And uh, she is the director of Popular Resistance. And I'm sure at one point she will put in the, the uh, um, URL of her website so you can see that. Uh, wonderful articles on uh, the political situation in the United States and around the world and Popular Resistance. Uh, she's also on the administrative committee of United National Anti-War Coalition. And um, our uh, main person today that we will be discussing with is Scott Ritter. Um, uh, I've known Scott for a number of years. Uh, he lives close by from to where I live. And in the beginning of the Iraq war, uh, locally in uh, where we live, we, um, uh, I helped form a group called Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace which actually hosted the original conference that uh, formed UNAC nationally. Um, uh, one of the things we did was we quickly recognized that uh, a very important voice uh, uh, discussing what was going on in Iraq uh, lived in our community. It was Scott Ritter. Um, uh, Scott was a, um, a chief weapons inspector in Iraq. Uh, and he decided to tell the truth. Um, when the president of the United States and others were saying there were weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq, and that was the excuse for our invasion and war, uh, Scott, who was there on the ground and investigating this, said, we have found no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that put him on the outs a little bit with the powers that be, um, but it uh, put him in good stead with our local anti-war group, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. Uh, we called a big meeting in our town hall. It was filled to the brim. Uh, every chair and every wall space and floor space was filled up, and we had a wonderful meeting to discuss um, uh, the situation in Iraq and it really helped launch uh, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, which really helped launch uh, United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC. Well, today, Scott is doing the same thing. He's looking with an honest person's eye at what is going on in um, Ukraine, which is a very different war, and I think he will explain some of this uh, than the Iraq war. Um, and he's telling the truth. It's very, very difficult to do. Those of us that are doing it have to be very careful. We are censored in a lot of the social media. Scott will talk a little bit about that today too, I'm sure. Um, and, um, uh, and only one side is getting out. Uh, it's very, very difficult because all the Russian media has um, been stopped in the United States and media of other countries that have a different narrative than the United States has been stopped in the United States. Um, and really to get some information of what is being said on Russian media, what is being said by some people on the ground that you don't hear in the US media, you've got to go onto other kinds of platforms like Telegram, which is a, um, a platform that's uh, um, encrypted so people can't tell information and we're seeing other voices there and some of that is starting to get out a little bit in the United States. So with that I'm going to introduce Margaret who will uh, introduce the uh, first question to Scott 
and may say a couple of words. Margaret, uh, you're, you're up. Great, thank you so much, Joe. And welcome, Scott. Welcome everyone who's made it to the webinar tonight. It's really great to see you. And uh, the fact that you're here is, is just so important because as Joe said, there's so much misinformation going on right now about what's happening with Ukraine. And what's happening is really, you know, um, it's an example of kind of where we are right now in the world in so many facets in the militarization and the climate crisis, economic crises that we're facing and uh, really the culmination of, of, you know, years, as you'll hear, of uh, planning that's gone into bringing us to where we are today. But, it's, you know, it has such implications globally. It's really changing feels like it's changing everything and also putting us at great risk at the same time. So it's so important that we get accurate information. We're so grateful to people like Scott who are able to provide that, who has such a wealth of experience and uh, can provide us with that information so that we can share it out more broadly and try to cut through the lies that are being told to push us into a, a major and very dangerous conflict. So I'm going to stop there because I know we really want to hear from Scott, but I just thought, you know, Joe and I have a number of kind of areas that we want to concentrate on tonight. But before we get to that, Scott, I thought if you could just kind of give your feelings like where we are right now today, what's happening right now and kind of, uh, you know, anything that you want to share about that. Well, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll start by, you know, it, it better the, the best way to judge where we're at today is to understand where we came from. Um, back in the 1980s, uh, we had a Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. I mean, the United States led alliance called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, fronting, uh, confronting the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, and the, the line of uh, confrontation basically ran through Germany, West Germany, East Germany, both occupied at the end of the Second World War. Um, and this was a very dangerous situation, especially in the, in the early to mid-1980s when uh, the Soviet Union and the United States began introducing what we call intermediate nuclear forces. Um, these are missiles that, uh, you know, have a range of, say, 500 to 5,000 miles. Uh, but what made them especially dangerous was, for instance, in the Soviet case, the SS-20 had three warheads, and they had hundreds of these missiles. So if there was going to be a war in Europe, every single major European city would be destroyed. And I just want to say that one more time so it sinks in. Every single major European city in Europe will be destroyed if there was a war. The United States responded by deploying its own missiles, a, a cruise missile, Tomahawk, and then the, um, or the ground launch cruise missile, and then the, um, the Pershing II. And the thing about the Pershing II is that once it was launched from its base in Germany, it could hit Moscow uh, in seven to 10 minutes, meaning that there's no time for anybody to make a decision, uh, no, no time to think. If a launch was detected, you're going to hit the button and fire everything, which means not just every single major city in Europe, but every single major city in the United States would have been evaporated within 45 minutes. The world ends. This wasn't a joke, ladies and gentlemen. This was real. We lived it 24-7. I was raised in Germany. We lived in a German village next to a nuclear weapons depot. If there was a war, that would be one of the first targets hit. So every morning as a child, I woke up wondering if I was going to get the 200,000 degree suntan, which is basically what happens when a nuclear bomb goes off and the, hit, the heat flash hits you. That's the reality we lived in. The United States and the Soviet Union, or what we call Russia today, on the cusp of a war that could terminate life as we know it in the world. Now, the Cold War ended. It didn't just end on its own. One of the things I did as a Marine um, was not only trained to kill the Soviets, I was pretty proficient in what we call combined arms warfare, maneuver warfare, uh, but I also was the first inspector sent to the Soviet Union in 1988 to implement the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that got rid of those missiles I was telling you about. So there was a recognition on the part of the United States and the Soviet Union that these missiles represented a, a, an existential threat to the survival of the world, and they agreed to get rid of them. We did this. And because of that, we developed this trust that led to you know, a reduction of tension. And then the Soviet Union fell, the Warsaw Pact went away, and one would have thought that 
this was a perfect opportunity for a framework of peace to break out all over Europe. But the United States and the Europeans decided to keep NATO in place. Um, and, 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 and NATO transformed into something that um, it wasn't in, originally envisioned to be. It was originally envisioned to be a defensive organization, a defensive alliance, and then became uh, an alliance that now had European security as its mission, and that included offensive military action. We saw that in 1999 against the Serbs. Uh, we saw that in 2011 against the Libyans, and on and on and on. So the situation we find ourselves in today is instead of the world being a safer place after going through this horrific period of time in the 1980s, it's like we've gone back in time. It's like a Michael J. Fox movie. You know, we got in our DeLorean and we went too fast and poof, we're back in time. Because once again, we have NATO facing off against a, a, a Russian military uh, capability. And now the United States having withdrawn from the INF Treaty uh, in 2019 is talking about sending intermediate nuclear missiles back to Europe to recreate the exact same situation that we got rid of in the 1980s. Um, and, and now what's worse is that in, in the Cold War, it was called a Cold War because we never really got into a shooting match. Today we have a hot war. Today we have an actual large scale ground combat going on in the, 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 the largest European country, Ukraine. Uh, and it's a war that has already invoked the specter of nuclear weapons, with Russia saying that if NATO interferes, that represents an existential threat, and Russia may have to use nuclear weapons in response. So now NATO, for the first time, is talking about what its nuclear strike policy is. So we have two sides actively preparing for nuclear war as we speak. Ladies and gentlemen, the stakes couldn't get any higher than this. And therefore, you have to ask yourself, why is this happening? Did Russia wake up one morning and say, I want to invade Ukraine. I just want to destabilize the world and, and go for it. Or has Russia been reacting to the failure of NATO to dissolve itself at the end of the Cold War and instead expand itself eastward in a manner that Russia viewed as a threat? And this isn't a threat that Russia only recently talked about. We know that Russia has raised the expansion of NATO continuously since the 1990s. Uh, the National Security Archives has the, 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 the audio tapes of the phone calls from President Clinton and then President Yeltsin, where Yeltsin is begging Clinton not to expand NATO. This puts me in a bad light, he said. This is an embarrassment. I lose face with my people. And Clinton said, sorry, we're expanding NATO. Anyways, Vladimir Putin, when he became president, said, hey, rather than just expanding NATO, why don't you invite me in? And, and that way we don't have to worry about it. We'll make it one big happy club. And the United States wouldn't do it because NATO's purpose was to contain Russia, not absorb Russia. Uh, this, 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 this expansion of NATO has been viewed by Russia as a threat. We know this in 2007, Putin spoke at the Munich Security Conference, gave an outstanding speech, one of the best uh, examples of political, modern political rhetoric anywhere. Anywhere, I advise everybody to go and watch it. It is a brilliant speech, and he articulates forcefully and eloquently the Russian position. No one can say we don't know what the Russian position was. There it is, <laughs> spoken by the president himself. Um, one of the things he said is they, that this expansion of NATO represents an existential threat. It's a red line. How do we know this? William uh, Burns, you might, remember, you might know that name right now. He's currently the director of the CIA. At the time, in 2008, he was the U.S. ambassador to Russia. He wrote a memorandum called Nyet means Nyet. No means no articulating what the Russian position was in regards to NATO expansion. He said it's a red line and the Russians mean it. They view this as an existential threat. If you continue to expand NATO, and here's the important thing. And he wrote this in February 2009. If you continue to push for the expansion of NATO, Russia will have no choice but to invade Ukraine, and Ukraine will lose at a minimum the Crimea and the Donbass. He predicted the future. I guess maybe that's why he's the director of the CIA today. But he predicted the future accurately. No one can say we didn't know. We knew, and yet we continued to do this. And we pushed Russia into a corner until last December. They said enough is enough. They sent two draft treaties demanding a restructuring of the European security framework, and they demanded uh, Ukraine opt out of NATO, become neutral. They said, we're not joking. Take this seriously. 
If you don't take this seriously, we will have no choice but to undertake what they call the military technical option. They weren't taken seriously. The United States and Europe ignored them, belittled them, mocked them. And now we have what we have because the Russians don't bluff. That's lesson number one out of this whole thing is the Russians don't bluff. So as you evaluate what's going on, you hear a lot of spin out there about what's happening, the Russian, this, Russian, that. Take the Russians at face value. When they say they're going to do something, they're going to do something exactly the way they said they're going to do it. So that's where we are today. We have a major war ongoing in Ukraine, one that, by the way, Russia is winning decisively. I'm not here to promote war. You know, this is an anti-war um, group. But we're here to talk about the facts. And the fact is, Russia is winning this war decisively. We can go through the metrics all you want. Uh, you know, I have a, a, a huge amount of experience in this. I've been studying military math all my life. And I'm telling you right now, whatever metric you put up there, Russia has won this war hands down. And they're in the process of, I believe, wrapping up one of the most stunning military victories in modern history. But you won't, you won't hear about that because our media is spinning it the exact opposite. And maybe we can talk about why that is at a later date. But that's, that's where we are today. I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Um, I, I forgot to mention in Scott's introduction uh, his extensive military career and military experience. And I think we heard uh, some of that um, just now. Um, my question was going to be about the reasons for war, but you asked a lot of that. You answered a lot of that. Uh, we, we hear on the media here, again, that it was totally unprovoked. We don't hear about the expansion of NATO and the kinds of things that you said. But there's another aspect of it, maybe you could talk about it, is uh, as far as the United States is concerned, the war started in February. What is far as the people of Ukraine are concerned, it started in 2014, and there's been an ongoing war in the Donbass, which um, thousands of people have been killed. I'm wondering if you would like to mention anything uh, about that, Scott. Sure. Well, I think again, I'm a historian by, by training, so I always go back to the, to the beginning, <laughs> because I, I don't like to start in the middle of a story because you miss the context. Um, the beginning. The beginning actually goes back to World War II, um, uh, prior to World War II, you know, the ribbon, uh, the Molotov, Ribbentrop, 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 Tof, German name, <laughs> yeah, that basically divided Poland up in 1939 between Germany and the um, and the in the in the Soviet Union. Um, because of this this pact, the way Poland was divided, uh, Eastern Poland became Western Ukraine, and. Um, and so it was this artificial entity that was lobbed on to uh, Western Ukraine and the population of Eastern Poland, also it's known in history as Galatia, uh, has been very resentful of the Soviet, of Soviet rule. And when the Soviet, when the Ru Germans invaded uh, the Soviet Union in June of 1941, they were actually welcomed as liberators by the, the population of Western Ukraine. Uh, almost overnight, 80,000 of these Ukrainian, Western Ukrainian, Eastern Poles immediately joined the German military as part of the Waffen SS. Um, and so they, they began to express their militancy in the, in, in the form of one of the most odious Nazi organizations imaginable, the Waffen SS, the military arm of, um, of the Nazi party. Uh, and they fought for, um, for, for, the, for the Germans. And they didn't just fight, they murdered. Um, they committed atrocities against the Poles. They committed atrocities against the Russians. They committed atrocities against the Jews. Uh, a lot of people will, will hear of the Babi Yar massacre that uh, took place in Kiev. Over 30,000 Jews shot down over the course of several days. Uh, it may have been directed by the Germans, but the trigger men were Ukrainians. These Western Ukrainians that joined the, 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 the SS. Um, this, the, they had a guy named Stepan Bandera. Stepan Bandera is their leader. He was their leader beforehand. He uh, basically joined the, the, the German cause. Um, they, they'll claim as a Ukrainian nationalist that he joined not because he supported Hitler, 
but because he was against Stalin. But he wore a German uniform, and his men worked for the Waffen-SS, and they killed Jews. So to me, there's no distinguishing the, the two. But in 1944, as Germany began to lose the war, um, the, the, the Bandera movement uh, broke away from the Germans. It began a, an act of resistance against the, 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 the Soviets. And we're talking large-scale resistance. I can show you how large it was from 1944 until 1954, uh, this resistance killed over over 300,000 Ukrainians lost their lives because of this resistance. 36,000 Soviet security forces and, and Red Army soldiers lost their lives. This is a major war for, for going on for a decade. And what makes this major war uh, important is that many of the Ukrainians were controlled by a German intelligence organization, I think it's called the 12th Department, headed by uh, a, a German general named Galen. Um, when the war ended, the United States, rather than arresting Galen and prosecuting him for war crimes, instead brought in his entire organization, called it the Galen Organization, and subordinated it to the CIA so that it can continue running operations in the Soviet Union. And from 1945 until 1955, the CIA funded this Ukrainian opposition, trained it, sent it weapons, organized it. In 1955, they basically were defeated, um, but the CIA didn't walk away. From 1955 until 1990, the CIA continued to fund and support and nurture this Bandera movement um, as part of their, uh, their propaganda effort. They kept them alive, kept the ideology alive as part of their anti-Soviet activity. This funding only stopped in 1990, but the reason, reason why I bring it up is that when we talk about 2014, we're, we talk about the empowerment of the Bandera movement um, from a small, uh, you know, right-wing, um, you know, ideology that had a limited political um, impact into this major player in, in Ukraine. And, and some people say, well, how could you have known? How could you have known this was going to happen? How could you have known the CIA built it, nurtured it, grew it, owned it, controlled it? Um, it wasn't a secret to the United States. So we knew exactly what we were doing when we breathed life into this militant movement in 2014. You know, we supported these color revolutions. 2004, there was a color revolution, the Orange Revolution, that throughout old Soviet rule brought in new quote unquote democracy. There's never been a democracy in Ukraine. Ukraine is one of the most corrupt nations on the planet. Everybody talks about Russian oligarchs. The Ukrainians have more oligarchs per capita than the Russians do, and their oligarchs actually control the politics. How did Zelensky become president? Zelensky was a comedian working for a channel owned by an oligarch who decided, I want to make you president. Zelensky didn't wake up one day and go, I want to be president. He played one on TV, a very popular comedy, I think called Servant of the People. I've watched it. Funny as heck really good show. You should watch it. Um, but it's not reality. It's fiction. But it, it, it's like if Americans were watching West Wing and decided to elect Martin Sheen as president because he played one on TV. Martin Sheen has no qualification to be president of the United States, but he played one on TV. So we're going to we're going to make him president. Well, that's what the Ukrainians did because the state of their politics is so horrible. But going back to 2014, there was a pro-Russian uh, president named uh, Viktor Yanukovych who was struggling with a major economic problem. Uh, the majority of Ukrainians wanted to be aligned with the European Union economically. I think they saw that their future, uh, their best economic future was through Europe, not through Moscow. The problem is the conditions that the European Union were, were in, seeking to impose were prohibitive. Uh, and it would have required actually Russia to pay for Ukraine to become an EU member. And Putin met with, uh, with, with, with Yanukovych and said, look, I don't care if you join the EU. I'm just not going to pay for it. <laughs> Russia's not paying for it. So if you want to join, join. But if you can't afford it, then you got to come in and, and work with me. And so Yanukovych thought about it and said, okay, we can't afford it. I'm going to Russia. Well, the people rose up. There was, there was um, you know, demonstration street. Peaceful demonstrations, by the way, very peaceful demonstrations, the legitimate expression of democracy. I don't think anybody had a problem. Yanukovych didn't have a problem with these demonstrations. He understood where they were coming from. But then what happens is the United States and the European Union come in and say, there's a weakness here. 
we can solve this problem by orchestrating a coup d'etat that will eliminate Yanukovych and we can bring in our own people. And these are people that the United States government had identified early on and we had been training them actively. How do we know this? Because Victoria Newland, who is the State Department official responsible for that part of the world, has been intercepted with a phone call, a famous phone call where she told the European Union something um, <laughs> that we can't say on, on, on polite panels. But, um, but she also talked about um, our boy Yats. Yats, of course, is short for uh, the name of a, a man who eventually became the prime minister of, uh, of Ukraine. We handpicked this guy. We handpicked the government. We were talking about Yats competing with Klesko and all this stuff and who's going to be the best person. We're making the decisions. And this is a coup d'etat. Mm -hmm. Now, the peaceful demonstrators can't get rid of Yanukovych. So we brought in the people we know. We brought in the Bandera people. And they came in armed. They seized, uh, they, they stormed police uh, armories, took weapons, came down, and they overnight, they turned what was a peaceful demonstration in, in the Maidan Plaza into a violent revolution that killed scores of people. Horrible acts of violence. I mean, again, I'm not, you know, I don't want to get too political here. We call what happened in January 6th of last year an insurrection of 2020, uh, yeah, 2021, I think, an insurrection. You know, the, the horrific storming of the U.S. Capitol. I condemn it with all my heart. I view that as a gross acts of violence. That's a demonstration, God bad. But it wasn't an insurrection, ladies and gentlemen. An insurrection, they would not have voluntarily left the Capitol. An insurrection would have gotten in with guns blazing, killing every member of Congress. That's what an insurrection does. How do we know? Because there was an insurrection in the Maidan in, in February 2014. That's what an insurrection looks like. It was a U.S. orchestrated insurrection to achieve one purpose, to get rid of Viktor Yanukovych. How do we know that? Because Joe Biden called Viktor Yanukovych in person and said, you got to go. I don't mean to get angry, but come on, man. What is regime change policy? We've never had regime change policy. Why did Biden get on the phone and tell Yanukovych he has to go? That's regime change policy, literally writ large, big letters, and he left. But now what happened? You've created this mess. You've empowered these Nazis, and they're now in charge. Now, people say, well, get it, but Scott, they're minorities, man. They're just, okay, yeah, they had the violence and the Maidan and all that, but at the end of the day, when they ran for parliament, they didn't get majorities in parliament. Well, you know what? who else didn't have a majority? The Bolsheviks. You go back and study Russian history, you got these two major elements. You got the Mensheviks, which means small, and the Bolsheviks, which means big. But the Mensheviks are actually big, and the Bolsheviks are actually small. Why did the Bolsheviks win? Because they were violent. They were violent. And so now you've empowered these Bandera-worshipping neo-Nazis to come in and seize power, and they're not going to let it go. They immediately intimidate the Ukrainian Rada to start passing laws that empowered nationalism, Ukrainian nationalism, at the expense of Russian-speaking Ukrainians and ethnic Russians. They outlaw the language, they outlaw the culture, and then they violently seek to impose their will. They go down to Odessa, city on the coast. There's a riot there after a soccer game. They, they throw 150 pro-Russian demonstrators into the House of Culture, then set it on fire. Over 40 people die. The Russians are enraged. Ukrainians start to make a move towards Crimea, and the Russian government says, not so fast. They send in the little green men, and Russia takes control of Crimea, blocking them. But where do the Nazis go from there? They head straight to the Donbass. They start assaulting the Russian population there. The Russians rose up. They declared independence. A curious fact, Vladimir Putin didn't recognize them as independent states. He rejected that. He said, no, you're part of, of Ukraine. We have to respect the, the, the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine, but we will support you in your effort to defend your rights. And so thus began the Ukrainian civil war in the Donbass, where the Ukrainian army, uh, backed by these neo-Nazi military units, <laughs> trying to forcefully impose themselves on a Russian population that rejects being manhandled by the Ukrainians. They form independent militias that are supported by the Russians. And now we have a war, a civil war. And it's a horrible war. It breaks down into front lines. And, and here's the nature of the fighting. Victor Poroshenko, uh, one, you know, a, a president that came in um, after 
the series. He's the president before Zelensky gave a speech. And he says, let me tell you what's going to happen. He's talking to the people of Donbass. Our kids, meaning Ukrainian kids, are going to go to kindergarten. Then they're going to go to store and they're going to go to the park and they're going to have a normal life. Your kids are going to be cowering in the basements while we shell you every single day. You want to know why the Russians are mad? Because that's the life that these Russians were subjected to. 14,000 people lost their lives in the course of eight years. Nonstop violence. It could have come to an end. In 2015, uh, so, uh, something called the Normandy Format, that was the, uh, the Germans, the French, the Ukrainian government got together with the Russians there as observers, and they agreed to a ceasefire uh, that, that, and keeping the Donbass in Ukraine, but that the legislation of Ukraine would pass a series of laws that gave sort of a special autonomous status to the Russians so that they wouldn't be impacted by the anti-Russian laws that had been passed. A very reasonable thing. But when Poroshenko tried to implement it, these neo-Nazis, remember this minority, told him, if you do that, we will kill you. Again, we're talking about what, what the definition of an insurrection is. Imagine somebody telling Joe Biden, if you sign that legislation, I'm going to kill you. The Secret Service would be all over that person. That would be the last you ever heard of him. Rightfully so. But here the Nazi says, you sign it, you die. So guess what happens? He doesn't sign it. Zelensky comes in. On a, you know, on a platform of peace, and he wants to implement Minsk. But he was told, not just told, they made a videotape of this where the guy basically says to the videotape, if he signs it, he'll be hanging by the neck until dead on some major Kiev thoroughway. And it's the truth. If Zelensky signed it, he'd be hanging by the neck until dead. Who runs Ukraine? It's not Zelensky. It's not the parliament. It's the Nazis. And if you're a Russian, and I'm going to leave it with this, because this is, an, this is the emotional part. You thought losing 14,000 people was emotional? I'm going to give you what emotional is. Emotional is losing 23 to 32 million people in a war against Nazi Germany. That is what defines Russia today. Every major town, every major city has a monument to the people who died. Every family lost people, one, two, three, four, five, a dozen, 20. In that war, the biggest holiday in Russia is May 9th, Victory Day. It's not like in America. When was the last time the United States celebrated Victory in Europe Day? Never. Not in our memory. We forgot about it. We don't have any more World War II veterans. They're all dead or dying. But the Russians, they're dead and dying too. You know how they remember it? They form something called the Immortal Regiment. So the family members of those veterans carry the portraits of the people who fought in that war, and they parade by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands every May 9th in remembrance of this. It's in their DNA. And now you're asking them to sit back and watch the Nazi ideology come to life in Ukraine and do nothing about it? And Amer I'm sick and tired of hearing Americans saying denazification, which is one of the military objectives set forth by Vladimir Putin. It's a myth. It's a joke. It's nothing. You know, it's, Scott, it's as yeah. real as it gets, man. It's as real as it gets. Yeah, you know, Scott, I was in, in Ukraine a couple of times in the last couple of years. Last time I was there, it was around May 9th. It was on, on May 2nd um, that, to be with the people in Odessa who were uh, the family members of the, of, of the people that were killed by the Nazis at, at the House of Trade Unions. And Trade Union. in oh. Ukraine, they stopped... Um, celebrating Victory Day. Um, it, it's no longer celebrated, but it is celebrated by the people. They come out anyway, and they're intimidated by the Nazis when they do, and they continue to come out. And just a couple of other things on what you said. You know, Bandera has been named a hero of the country in Ukraine. That's that's the status he is right, right now. And I want to say one other thing about uh, Ukraine. And one of the leaders of the massacre you mentioned in Kiev, uh, where 33,000 uh, Jews were, were killed there when the Nazis was there, uh, was allowed into the United States after World War II. And um, right up near where I live and near where you live, about an hour south of, of Albany, he started a camp, um, uh, which is a summer camp for Ukrainians. 
And they have statues there of what they call the heroes, including Bandera statues and the other collaborators. And they meet there once a year. They wear the uniforms of the Nazi collaborators of the organization of, uh, of Ukrainian nationalists, and they celebrate uh, some of these people. So this is going on very seriously there and also here. But I want to get on to more of the military situation that's going on right now, the humanitarian situation, talk about um, uh, Bucha, uh, Before we economic do that, situations, and I'd like to turn it over to Margaret to get into that. <laughs> well, actually, I, I, you know, there's so much to unpack here. And, and before yeah. we move on to the humanitarian situation, which is really important, um, Scott, you've been doing a lot of, of good writing about the legality of this. And, you know, one of the things that I don't hear mentioned um, is, you know, leading up to, I mean, Russia started really a massive evacuation of, uh, of Russian people in the Donbass region on February 18th, as the, you know, the Ukraine military, the Aetsov Battalion started escalating their violations of the ceasefire agreement, the Minsk Accord, tr dramatically. And, and of course, that's when the Duma you know, I guess passed a resolution asking to to um, recognize Donetsk and Lugansk, and and then the leaders of those regions are you know asking for help. So I think that's something. If you could comment on why it became so critical on February twenty fourth that Russia begin this military intervention, um, but then as well as that, more on the legitimate uh, security concerns of Russia considering Article four of NATO. And so if you could talk about both of those. Okay, well, let's, again, um, in the World War II, the United Nations was formed, and um, one of the goals of the UN was to ban war. Uh, I think uh, the Nuremberg, Nuremberg Military Tribunal um, had uh, come to an agreement that the greatest war crime of all was, the, uh, was a war of aggression, because from the war of aggression, all other war crimes emerge. And so the idea was, how do we stop wars of aggression? They just banned it outright, illegal. There's two, there's two exceptions to this. One is a Chapter 7 resolution passed under by the Security Council of the United Nations. And that is when the Security Council determines that a situation has occurred that threatens international peace and security and the welfare of nations, that it can authorize UN member nations to use military force to rectify that situation. Um, the most recent example of a Chapter 7 war was Operation Desert Storm back in 1990, 1991. 1991 was Desert Storm, Desert Shield was 1990, in response to Saddam Hussein's invasion and occupation of Kuwait. Uh, again, I'm not here to you know, say good, bad, whatever. I'm just talking about the law right now. Um, and the law said uh, when, when he invaded Kuwait, the Security Council met and said, we're authorizing the use of military force, and military force was used to achieve the liberation of Kuwait. That is a lawful war. It doesn't make it a just war. It doesn't make it a good war. It's just a lawful war. Um, the other way that uh, force is, is through Article 51. Article 51 allows for legitimate self-defense, uh, either in terms of an individual nation or collective self-defense. And that's an important notion right now, collective self-defense. That's going to come into play. So basically, if you're attacked, you have the inherent right of self-defense. But now we come to uh, uh, one of the, the questions that, that emerged. And it actually comes from a period in, uh, in American history, actually, 1837. There was a U.S. ship called the Caroline operating up by the Canadian border. And the Caroline was providing weapons and manpower, was smuggling weapons and material support to some Canadian rebels that were fighting the British Army. And the British Army knew that the ship was coming in, so the British Army attacked it. So the British Army, the uh, British Navy attacked the U.S. vessel, uh, which is an act of aggression, unprovoked, they would say. But the British made the claim of the need of preemption based upon the imminent threat posed by the Caroline to the security of the British. So the concept of preemptive self-defense was born. And actually, the Caroline affair, the Caroline case, is quoted to this day as one of the bedrock, um, you know, the legal precedents for the doctrine of preemption. And preemption is basically, if you're, if somebody's sitting there, you know, bandaging their fist, getting their fist ready, telling you they're going to punch you, lifting weights, getting that big old arm up, and then they're ready to go, 
And you say, well, I'm not going to wait and just get punched. Pop, I'm going to hit him first. You preempted the attack. And that is legitimate self-defense. If there is a genuine imminent threat that can't be resolved by, for instance, going to the Security Council and asking for help. If you feel that you have to act now and a failure to act now would put you at an existential threat, you can preempt. People have tried to use preemption. The United States tried to use this doctrine of preemption to justify the 2003 invasion of Iraq. It was all a lie. You can't preempt based on a lie. You can't manufacture a case on weapons of mass destruction and the nexus they form with al-Qaeda terrorism when there are no weapons of mass destruction and there is no nexus to al-Qaeda terrorism. So that falls apart. Now we come to Russia. Russia has articulated an Article 51 justification for its action in Ukraine. And they articulated as a preemptive collective self-defense. Now, how, how, do, how can they do that? First of all, let's understand that you can't, Russia has no legal right to inter intervene in Ukraine if this is an internal Ukrainian dispute. Meaning that so long as the Donbass was considered to be part of Ukraine, uh, whatever the Ukrainian government is doing to the Russian speakers of, of Donbass is not Russia's affair. Russia can't intervene. They have no authority to intervene. They can go to the Security Council and ask for a Chapter 7 resolution to be passed, authorize intervention to resolve this, but they knew that that wasn't going to happen because Ukraine was in bed with the United States and NATO. So this is where what you, something you spoke of is very important. The two oblasts or districts of uh, the Donbass, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. Um, they passed resolutions uh, earlier declaring their independence, but Russia did not recognize their independence. What they did now, or recently, in, 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 in February of, uh, of, of this year, is they petitioned, they, they, they passed their own uh, legislation petitioning Russia to recognize them as an independent state. The Russians received that petition considered that the petition, and then the Russian parliament granted that petition. Why is all this important? That's how constitutionally it has to proceed. So no one can say that this was just made up. No, the laws of the, of the two oblasts, the laws of Russia were preserved. Constitutional due process was seen. It was then presented to Vladimir Putin, who signed the documents recognizing the independent status of Lugansk and Donetsk. Now what has happened overnight? They're no longer an integral part of Ukraine. And so Russia now can say this poses a threat, but then there's another problem. Wait a minute, no one recognizes them but Russia. It's not like the United Nations says, oh well, Lugansk and Donetsk, you're part of the family. So are they protected by the United Nations Charter if they're not a member? And the answer is no, except Except here comes the, the nice little, little exception here. Unless they're part of a collective security arrangement with a UN member. And guess who is a UN member? Russia. So Russia now has a collective security arrangement, another treaty that was signed after the recognition of independence. And this collective security arrangement now allows Russia to intercede on behalf of these, these security partners uh, and, and, and resolve the security situation. Now, this only allows Russia to intervene in the Donbass, if we're talking about the law of war. Russia, however, took a look at the situation and said, well, wait a minute, if we go into the Donbass, the Ukrainians have massed between 60 and 100,000 heavily armed troops on the, uh, on, in eastern Ukraine. Um, and we have intelligence that they're getting ready to launch an attack into the Donbass to preempt our assistance. So now if we go into the Donbass without dealing with this problem, that creates an existential threat for our security operation. We need to preempt the Ukrainian assault. So now the Russians are using the doctrine of preemption as part of collective self-defense to go after the, 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 the Ukrainian buildup in Eastern uh, uh, Donetsk. But you say, well, wait a minute, Scott. <laughs> but didn't they also come up from Crimea and come down towards Kiev? How does that fit in? Because now, if you're going after those people, now you have to shape the whole battlefield. And from the Russian perspective, it's not just about the 100,000 troops you're trying to pin down in, in the Donbass, it's about the 100,000 troops up by Kiev, it's about the 80,000 troops out in Western Iraq, it's about the 60,000 troops near Odessa. If you don't do anything about them, they will be able to maneuver in support of the other Ukrainians and defeat the Russian army. So now the Russians have to enlarge the scope of their preemptive attack 
to pin down these forces. And that's what we saw. When we saw the Russians coming in, it may look like this massive invasion of Ukraine is taking place. But the fact is, all these other things are merely supporting attacks to shape the battlefield so that Russia can accomplish the primary mission of destroying 100,000 Ukrainian troops that are positioned opposite the Donbass and liberate the Donbass region. And um, what I just articulated right now, if I gave this presentation in law school, um, I would probably get a B plus, but it is a cognizable articulation of a legitimate Article 51 claim under collective self-defense. Uh, the United States may try to disagree with it, but the problem with that is that the United States was part of a similar Article 51 collective self-defense argument put forward in 1999 when NATO bombed Serbia. It's the exact same thing. It was good for us then. All Russia's done is take that page, make it better, and put it out there. It's the same argument, the same case, and the same legitimacy, even more so because everything Russia has said about the threat from the Ukrainian army is true. Everything the NATO used to justify their preemption, for instance, the concept of, of the Serbians committing genocide against the coast of our Albanians was a lie. Uh, whatever deaths were occurring is because the CIA was working with the Kosovo Liberation Army to create uh, uh, incidents that provoked fighting with the Serbians, which was then called genocide. Uh, it's just like the case, remember, we talked about the United States invading Iraq, and you can't get legitimacy off of making up a case about WMD. Well, you can't get legitimacy about making up a case about uh, you know, Serbian genocide. Nothing we're talking about with the Russians is made up. The, the harm that was befalling the, uh, the people of Donbass, the 14,000 dead, the buildup of Ukrainian military power, all of it is real, and all of it can represent an imminent threat to the security that justifies preemptive self-defense, and a collective security arrangement. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion the last couple of days of what happened in Bucha, for instance, and uh, I think we need to talk uh, about that. What we don't hear, and I just want to also throw this in, is the humanitarian um, situation on the other side. What happened in Donbass, the, the 14,000 that have been killed, the continual bombing of residential areas, um, also, what's been going on in Maripol and other other places? Someone put in the chat um, the uh, um, uh, URL for Patrick Lancaster, who's an American in in um, uh, Maripol. And I just listened to one of his broadcasts today. He was just going and interviewing people, um, uh, and they were saying how the Russians were their liberators. But we don't hear that. Um, here and how the Ukrainians were shooting at them and, and killing them and not letting them leave the area. And it was them that was attacking them during these humanitarian corridors. And we hear of the vast numbers of people who have been leaving the country, which is very interesting because um, it became very difficult for people to leave the country of Iraq during the Iraq war. We used to bomb them when they tried to leave. Um, and, you know, Russians, we haven't seen bombing the cities in massive ways like Kiev, like we did with weapons of mass destruction and killed massive numbers in a very, very short period of time with Iraq. But the other aspect is there's refugees that have gone to Russia, probably over a million now since 2014 uh, to escape the fighting, and we don't hear any of that. So maybe you can comment on Bucha and the humanitarian situations in general, and um, and then um, uh, get Margaret to, to ask some more questions. <laughs> well, I know I got to be careful not to go too long because I know we're running out of time, but context is everything. Uh, in 1991, I was one of the planners and implementers of Operation Desert Storm. Operation Desert Storm was a major military operation against the Iraqis. It kicked off with a, uh, I believe, a 44-day um, uh, strategic air campaign. Um, we started off that air campaign by blowing up every means of communication, meaning we shut down the radios, we shut down the TVs, we shut down everything. We blew up all the bridges, we blew up all the highways, we blew up everything electrical generation plants, uh, petroleum plants, fuel, and this went on for 44 days. Um, and we slaughtered the Iraqi people, slaughtered them. It's not a 
not a violation of the war. Everything we bombed was a legitimate military target. But the point is, um, <laughs> we killed a lot of Iraqi civilians. Now, the reason why I bring that in is Russia engaged in a major military campaign against Ukraine. You know what they didn't do? They didn't shut down cell phone service. They didn't shut down internet connectivity. They didn't shut down the railroads. They didn't shut down the highways. Uh, they let the Ukrainian people travel to and fro here and there. They allowed the president of Ukraine to get on video conferences with the United States Congress, with British Parliament, with the European Union, with NATO, video conferences that not only elevated his status as a leader, but generated billions of dollars of military aid that then flowed in, was turned over to the Ukrainian army and killed Russian soldiers. So the military imperative, the military necessity of shutting this down is real, but Russia didn't do it. Why? Because Russia isn't viewing this as a war like we viewed the war against the Iraqis. Russia is viewing this as a special military operation. People make fun of that word, but it's not war because if it was war, Ukraine would be gone today, eliminated. You wouldn't recognize it. Unfortunately, it's getting that way because the, the way the Ukrainians have opted to defend means they're putting their military forces in residential areas, and those areas are getting bombed and destroyed and people are dying. But the original Russian approach was a very soft approach. They didn't use Russian doctrine of overwhelming military fi uh, firepower, artillery that flattens everything, followed by a massed tank attack that runs over everything. That's not what they did. They actually came in with light infantry units up front who tried to negotiate their way through the towns and cities, meet with the elected officials and say, we're not a threat. Let's let us go through and do our job. We won't bother you. You can continue to govern the way you want to govern. I believe the Russians were told by their intelligence professionals that they would be received, well received. Um, the rumors are that Putin has arrested several of these intelligence officials because they got it wrong. Uh, and the Russians weren't well received, and the Russians lost a lot of men up front trying to come in soft. But the point is the Russians have never changed their position, which is they are there not to defeat the Ukrainian people, but to defeat Nazis, to demilitarize, and to bring minimal harm. And we have written orders to this effect. Now, unfortunately, there's been fighting, and, um, and, 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 and we see... You know, there are civilian casualties and there are refugees. Uh, that is just one of the horrific realities of war, which is why the United Nations sought to ban war to begin with. And everybody should ensure that the last option is always uh, military action, that we exhaust every venue short of war before we go to war, because war is horrible. War is awful. You don't want to glamorize war. You don't want to legitimize war. But it's happening right now. And we need to understand that the Russians have done everything humanly possible to minimize the damage that's been done to the Ukrainian civilians and Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. We see the Russian concern when you talked about it, Joe, about how before the war started, they began the evacuation of civilian populations out of the war zone, which is one of the things you are required to do under the international humanitarian law. That if you are gonna wage conflict in an area where there are civilian structures, you have a duty and responsibility to get the civilians the hell out of there before the fighting starts. Because if you don't, then you're using them as de facto human shields. Well, guess who hasn't evacuated the civilians? The Ukrainians. And now we come to the opposite end. The Russians have gone out of their way to treat Ukrainian civilians with respect. What have we learned about the Ukrainian nationalists, the Nazis? They view anybody who collaborates with the Russians any one of these mayors who said, yeah, come on in, keep going, uh, we're not going to harass you, uh, they are now collaborators who will be killed. And they are being killed. They're being arrested and assassinated by the Ukrainian government for the crime of collaboration. They're doing the same thing with people who receive Russian humanitarian uh, aid. The Russians hand out these uh, aid packets that are in little green boxes. They have a white star. You may have seen them. They say volume toward military store, uh, but they hand them out their dry rations and they, and they give them to people who are hungry, who are starving. Um, it is a crime to possess one of these. If you possess one of these and the Ukrainian National Police catch you, you are treated as a collaborator and you are killed. And this becomes important when we start talking about Bucha in a minute. But you know, as this war goes on too, we're, we're seeing another thing, the displacement of people. People tend to run away from combat zones because most people are rational 
thinking people and they don't want to be around where shells are going up. So they flee and they try to flee out of the combat zone, which means now millions of people are fleeing into Europe, into Poland, into Hungary, into uh, Slovakia, into um, uh, uh, Romania, Moldova. Uh, they're, they're fleeing there and this creates a crisis of its own. And you talked about Article 4. You know, one of the, 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 the big things about NATO, people talk about collective defense, an attack against one is an attack against all. That's Article 5. It's only being invoked once right after 9-11 in pretty much what was a propaganda show by the United States to show that the world was lined up behind it. Uh, they flew some airplanes over the United States uh, for a, you know, a airborne warning uh, as if the terrorists were going to hijack even more aircraft. And, and they sailed some ships in the Mediterranean, but it wasn't real. But NATO has been at war many times. The other article that authorized NATO to go to war is Article 4, and that's basically where the members can consult with one another on matters of uh, imminent security concern of one or more members. Uh, they've used that excuse to take on Serbia, to go into Libya, to go into Iraq after the invasion, to go into Afghanistan. Um, and today they've convened Article 4. Uh, Poland and the Baltic nations have convened an Article 4 uh, con uh, consultation, and they're talking about what can we do in Ukraine? NATO recognizes that if they send military troops into Ukraine, uh, they lose Article 5 protection. Uh, so meaning that if Russia responds, you can't gin up the whole NATO uh, group under Article 5, but you can gin them up under Article 4. And that's the danger. Right now there's active discussions in NATO about creating a humanitarian buffer in Western Ukraine so that these refugees, refugees don't come into Europe proper. They're held in place in Western Ukraine, um, but they need to be protected so NATO troops will come in. Initially, people said, well, that's insane because if we do that, the Russians are going to attack and now we'll find ourselves where two nuclear armed opponents are facing off against each other uh, at a time when they're both talking about using nuclear weapons. So there's been a lot of um, hesitation about getting people involved, but as this war progresses, and I believe it's going to get far worse before it gets better, there's going to be even more humanitarian pressure on Europe uh, in the form of this wave of refugees, and there will be more pressure on Europe to do something about it, uh, to include uh, putting um, a, a buffer zone in that could lead to force-on-force -force conflict with, uh, with Russians. 